Welcome, everyone. Please take your seats. We're about ready to start the program. What a great group under the tent here today. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. I'm Peggy Clark, and I'm co-director, along with Ruth Katz in the front. Ruth, will you stand up, of Spotlight Health? And executive director of Aspen Global Innovators Group here, and I'm really thrilled you are all here. We have a great gathering. We have, in fact, two former Secretaries of Health and Human Services, Honorable Kathleen Sebelius and Tommy Thompson. I think they're in the house. Are you in the house? <laughs> Along with so many others, this is really such a great group. And to kick off today's program, I am especially thrilled to introduce someone who spent four years himself at HHS under Donna Shalala when she was secretary during the Clinton administration. And he's our new president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, Dan Porterfield. So Dan has done many, many things in his life. He was formerly a senior vice president and English professor at Georgetown University, and most recently, the president of Franklin and Marshall College, where he really upended our whole notion of higher education and how to make it accessible to everyone. So that's Dan's professional resume. And Dan, I'm going to give you a little bit of your own medicine. So just to start us off, as everyone knows, here at Spotlight Health and at Aspen, we like everyone to relax, take your shoes off. I want to just tell you a little bit about a quote from Dan's uh, commencement speech that he just gave at Franklin and Marshall. And here's what he said, and this is back to you, Dan. You all have professional resumes, but try making a life resume too. Just one page that speaks to who you truly are and what you deeply value. I'd recommend four sections, each headed by a question. When did I grow? When did I help someone else? When did I deal well with fear or pain? When did I feel joy or love? All you need to do is create the experiences that fill in those sections. Just create and note your growth. Just help people. Just acknowledge pain and put it to some good use. Just savor the feelings of joy and love. Keep creating these experiences, Dan. Keep making this meaning and you'll find another section starts to appear, maybe at the bottom of the life resume rather than at the top. That section, emerging out of your actions and explorations, will be called purpose. And years later, perhaps that section will start to appear at the top. Um, I speak for every person at the Aspen Institute uh, to say that we are overjoyed and over the moon and honored to welcome you to this chapter in the purpose of your life. Dan Porterfield. Well, thank you, Peggy, for that um, lovely introduction, um, at least the first part, second part, um, and for your leadership uh, with Ruth Katz, uh, with Katie Dresser, your teams, for organizing an extraordinary series of discussions aimed at framing problems and finding solutions. Uh, a number of our interns are here now, so I'm gonna give the interns a little bit of secret advice, and that is that when you start a new job and you get those first speaking opportunities, take the risk of saying what you mean. That's what I'm gonna to try to do today. Say what you mean. So, the conference organizers have brought in people from all over the world to talk about medical breakthroughs, unpack scientific advances, and examine the transformational promise and risk of technology. One theme you'll hear often over the next few days is disruption for good and for ill. There's an enormous amount of change taking place right now all across the world, from how we provide health care in the U.S. and fight cancer in Africa, to how we harness the power of design thinking and implement strategies to reduce the cost of medicine. We will take you to the cutting edge of genetics, propose novel ways to prevent chronic disease, and share insights about the microbiome. And we'll talk about where the visionaries and venture capitals think we can go next. I love this array of themes. I love the array of backgrounds that we represent. I love the cross-cultural, multidisciplinary, evidence-based, results-oriented methodologies that we employ. It's especially important 
that we work in a nonpartisan, open-minded way, gathering perspectives inclusively, willing to entertain ideas that may not appeal to us, always asking critically if we've drawn enough voices to the table and done so respectfully. I suspect among us here there are a few core convictions that we share. One, for example, is that advances in access and excellence in healthcare offer people of our planet greater quality of life than ever before. And thus we must keep questioning, keep learning, keep researching, keep discovering, keep sharing the tools and treatments that can enable greater human flourishing. A second conviction is that it's a lot smarter for any society to prevent illnesses than to resort only to treating them. And that it's also a lot smarter to empower people to take care of themselves rather than scrambling around trying to save them and stop the spread of further harm in desperate moments after a preventable calamity. A third conviction is that in every country and culture, successful health systems and strategies will benefit everything else from job quality to learning outcomes, from innovation to gender equity, from family stability to job creation, from local empowerment to national security. It's deeply interdependent when our health systems work and when they melt down. One more conviction. Surely we all share the belief that it matters to involve people in their own health care decisions, to give great weight to the choices people make about their lives, to treat cultures as a collection of assets and capabilities and wisdoms, to respect and engage cultural values, and to always bring an ethical sensibility to our conversations about who gets health care and what it is that they get. Those are four convictions. I bet the conviction upon which all those other convictions rest, I suspect, I hope, is that we all believe fundamentally in the dignity and value of each and every human being. All humans are equal. No one is more human than anyone else. We all deserve the opportunity to develop our talents, to express our faiths, to care for our children and our elders, and to flourish. I would argue that the greatest gift we have for the work that here we call promoting healthcare equity is our capacity to respect the dignity of all people. And from that essential power that we have as human beings, then to develop the interest and empathy to accompany one another to try to see with each other's eyes, to bear each other's burdens, to celebrate each other's joys, which also means that we have to say no when one group is being stigmatized or scapegoated or labeled as less than human. I'm a parent. My wife, Karen, is here. Uh, our daughters, Caroline and Sarah, are over there, perhaps drawn here against their will. <laughs> um, this is a paradox. We love our children the most, but we are called to love each other the same. This is a paradox. For me, the answer is not to crumble beneath that contradiction but to try to create the conditions where everybody else's children can live their best lives, just like Karen and I want our children to be able to live to their fullest. This means it's our work to help others build strong communities and good societies, because we believe in each person's human dignity and know the capacity of others to love their families precisely because of the intensity with which we love our own. Because we believe in human dignity, I believe that we should try to avoid picking sides too quickly or seizing upon 
a ready opportunity to score political points. Because we believe in human dignity, we should go the extra mile to avoid prejudging others' views or sizing up people fast so we can shut them down and take away their seat from the table and negate the experiences they would have shared there. Again, where does this commitment to openness come from? We tolerate or include or embrace or protect views we may not agree with, partly out of practical problem solving, partly out of enlightened self-interest, partly perhaps out of a sense of a social contract, but fundamentally because respecting the dignity of others means we must give them their due. And quite often, our own hearts and minds grow when we do that, even when it takes a strong spine to put up with ideas we wish we didn't have to hear. And this bring, which brings me to this, and thank you for listening. Because out of a love for humans and humanity, we work at being here the most inviting, inclusive, nonpartisan leaders and organizations that we can be. And here I'm talking about your organizations and mine, the Aspen Institute. We position ourselves because we make that commitment to openness as necessary and probably rarely and always with thought to speak aloud when we see in the actions of others a denial of human beings' dignity and ability to flourish. For that reason, as a healthcare advocate and as a human being, I believe, for example, that cigarettes should not be marketed to children. I believe that sex should not happen without consent. I believe that guns should be kept out of our schools. And I believe, with Pope Francis and First Lady Laura Bush, that the children at any border should not be taken from their parents and placed in 95 degree heat cages with captors mocking their whales, which is... <laughs> It's precisely because we admit that we do not have a monopoly on truth. It's precisely because with humility we protect the greatest range of thought and ideas. It's precisely because we actively seek out contrary views and protect speakers' rights that we can then look without blinking into the face of an atrocity and say, no, not here, not to humans, never again but it's our commitment to the biggest possible table for discussion that allows us then to have that clarity of thought when it's needed. But our core commitment is to openness to ideas and viewpoints and inclusiveness of all type, and then every now and then, occasionally, we simply have to say, this is not consistent with the human dignity that we uphold. One reason why the Spotlight Health Soil is so fertile for growing partnerships and solving problems is that when we talk about health here, we think in very broad terms. Those levers create a lot of common ground on which both audience members and speakers can meet. Together with you, I look forward to a great deal in the coming days. Thank you so much for being a part of Spotlight Health. Thank you very much. Now I'm thrilled to welcome to the stage Margaret Lowe, the president of Atlantic Live, our media partner for Spotlight Health and so many other big projects. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Dan. It's really wonderful to be here with you on your uh, first Aspen Ideas adventure at the helm of the Institute. Um, my Atlantic colleagues and I love our collaboration with the Institute on Spotlight Health. This is one of the most extraordinary gatherings. You've come from across the country and from around the world, from Ecuador, Japan, Kenya, Mexico, Nepal, Peru, Rwanda, the list goes on. Hundreds of leading thinkers and practitioners drawn together to grapple with some of the most pressing issues in health today. 
So on the shuttle last night uh, from the airport to town, uh, I met a physician who was just arriving from Philadelphia. And we launched immediately into conversation and we talked about how excited we were to be at this conference together. And then in the middle of our conversation, she looked at me and she said, are, are you a derm? And I said, am, am I a derm? I said, do you mean, am I a dermatologist? As it happens, there are two health conferences here in Aspen this week. Um, just in case you missed it, or if you're looking for a little corporeal diversion, there is a cosmetic boot camp taking place at the St. Regis, where attendees will be learning uh, the latest on Botox, fillers, and tucks. I think it's fair to say that it's a little less weighty than our focus here on the Aspen campus, but who's to judge? As for us, we will confine ourselves to the, um, shall we say, real cutting edge of medicine and science, the mental health impact of gun violence, breakthroughs in cancer treatment, opioids, doctor burnout, and more. And how lucky we are to have these critical conversations here in Aspen, where the fresh mountain air provides a sense of well-being, clears and sharpens the mind. John Muir, the environmental philosopher and the founder of the Sierra Club, who wrote a great deal for the Atlantic more than a century ago, believed deeply in the restorative power of nature and is known for saying, the mountains are calling and I must go. We're so glad you heard that call and that you are here. And so I will leave you with this, a spotlight, spotlight limerick. Elk, black bears, mountains, and moose, here we come to cut minds loose. Of matters of consequence, health, heart, and science, all with palm wonderful juice. <laughs> with that, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce my friend and one of the masterminds of this gathering, Peggy Clark, co-director of Spotlight Health. Peggy. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you inside our tent as we begin Spotlight Health 2018. I invite you, as others have, to sort of drop your shoulders down a little bit, take your shoes off, breathe in the mountain air, smile at the person next to you, and say yes to an experience that promises to open your mind, your heart, and your spirit over the next three days. Isn't it true, as Dan noted, that we all could use a little bit of hope these days? When you consider the health issues that we're all confronting as private or public health professionals in our own personal lives or as part of our collective family of 7.6 billion people, it's no wonder that we all may feel a little bit daunted. Access to health care is still dramatically and dangerously uneven among us, depending on where we live, what we can afford, our age, our race, and our gender. Children under five are still at greater risk of dying if they were born to households or in rural areas or to mothers who are denied education. Cancer, heart disease, HIV AIDS still plague us along with diabetes and mental illness. And the specter of Ebola and Zika still loom very large even while we need to prepare ourselves for that next disease X, which is unidentified virus that's looming in the unknown. In the face of these realities, we can all feel overwhelmed and lose sight of the personal impact that each of us may be having. We just can't see it. Doubt and inertia can creep into our minds at night, robbing us of the sheer will we need to keep up our good work. So for the next three days, and hopefully beyond, Spotlight Health offers you an antidote to the feeling of hopelessness. We offer you an experience of hope. We imagine a world where good health is accessible and affordable for all, especially the most vulnerable. We believe that we really can bring about this la lasting effect. How? By bringing together the experts we know are capable of achieving it, the people sitting right next to you, in front of you and behind you, right here, right now. 
Creating that future requires all of us to call forth the better angels of our nature. It begins with valuing science and empirical evidence, but there's no algorithm to rely on when things get really hard. We have to talk to each other. At Spotlight Health, you'll hear the gnarliest healthcare issues talked about. You'll be enlightened by new challenges you've never heard of, like permafrost and what's underneath there, or genomics, or many of the things we'll hear today. You'll be inspired by reimagined solutions from surprising sources. But most importantly, you'll witness the integrated kinship of a broad cross-section of experts extending far beyond medicine who will bring about the changes in health that we want to see in the world. You'll hear from community health workers, ministers of health, members of Congress, environmentalists, feminists, journalists, scientists, and venture capitalists. We're all here together. And we're so pleased that once again, after a very rigorous process of nomination and sponsorship and the generous goodwill of our partners, we have 100 scholars representing 30 countries from all facets of health and the economy who are joining us here. And they all have the chance to join with us, connect with us, and learn about the work of others. Altogether, we're bound to get a renewed sense that it takes a diverse group of people working in solidarity to bring about real change. Things get started here. It's a hothouse for achievers like all of you in this tent. New ideas get recognized, discussed, and then acted upon. It was actually here a few years ago when gun violence was first talked about as a public health epidemic. Last year, psychiatrist Dixon Chibanda of Zimbabwe presented the idea of a friendship bench using trained grandmothers to bring mental health treatment to many instead of the few who could afford professionals, an idea that's since been picked up by, in cities across the US and in countries across the world as a result of his being here. The U University of Global Health Equity, a new type of university that extends medical education to those from low-income backgrounds who will become the global leaders in health of tomorrow, was first presented here at an ideas incubator. And this year, it graduated its first class. The chancellor's here today. Where are you, Anis? You're somewhere. <laughs> So what you'll find for those who are new here is much of this magic starts from a spontaneous introduction after a presentation or a conversation along one of our beautiful Aspen paths. And a light bulb goes off in an informal exchange or a new alliance is born. So let me leave you with one thought. The idea of a healthy future and a better world is not waiting for us in the distance. It's not somewhere out there on the horizon, and it's not a place that we'll get to by just going along for the ride. It's a new way of thinking and a new way of behaving. We can get there with the active engagement, participation, and leadership from every single one of the incredible people who are inside this tent today. So we are delighted to welcome you here to Spotlight Health. You're going to have a wonderful couple of days. And I'd like to kick off our program by introducing one of the remarkable people we have here with us today, CNBC's resident expert on the business of healthcare, Bertha Coombs. Thank you so much. Well, we get acquainted here. I'm so excited to be here. What an amazing crowd. Um, so many people who I read about and admire and love to learn from. And we get to rub shoulders here in person. You know, it's an interesting thing. My family came from Cuba. I was born there. My parents um, uh, came in the mid-60s. And I have this feeling, uh, my, my father's parents were also immigrants. They went from Jamaica to Cuba. And uh, something about the Jamaican side in particular, they're awfully ornery. My dad was, <laughs> could be kind of ornery. And I think in general, immigrants are that way because they kind of say, you know what? I am going to leave what is safe. I am going to leave what I know. 
because I think I can do better. They go with this hope and they sometimes take steps backwards. You might be a doctor, but you may not have the language skills, so you drive a cab until you can get yourself back into the profession of healthcare. And it seems that when it comes to innovation and disruption, when I talk to folks in healthcare, they have that same kind of orneriness. We live in the best of times and worst of times in terms of what we can deliver, and yet we all feel like we really can do better and we need to do better. You are two leaders, Larry Merlo, the president and CEO of CVS Health, who is embarking on a real new and different path for your company. And Bernard Tyson, the chairman and CEO of Kaiser Health, is often held up as really what a lot of health systems want to achieve in terms of population health and in terms of integrated care. Talk about, I'd love for each of you to talk about what you're ornery about. What is it that you feel well, yeah, we want to do better in, in the way that you are approaching disruption and innovation? Well, Bertha, you answered a very important question, because when my colleagues turn around and say, Larry, why are you so ornery today? I'm going to say it's because we're in healthcare. And, but um, Bertha, I, I think as, as we look at our healthcare system today, obviously it has challenges. Many people say the system's broken. We, we would sit here and say, you know, our healthcare system was, uh, was created for episodic care in a fee-for-service environment, not one that you know, is created to support and provide for the individual healthcare needs of consumers. And, you know, healthcare has grown to almost $3.6 trillion. It's 18% of GDP. It's continuing to grow. You know, we know more than half of all Americans, you know, suffer from one or more chronic diseases. And the dollars that we're spending on that are not helping those individuals to achieve their best health. And, and I can go on and on. And you think about the size of this industry and the fact that you know, everybody is frustrated and dissatisfied with the results that we're getting. So I think that's a pretty good reason you know, to be ornery in terms of you know, we've got to do something different. The status quo is not sustainable you know, as we think about you know, the health of individuals, the health of communities, and the health of our country. Bernard, you're doing integrated care. You're kind of doing it right. Why are you still ornery? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't want to assume that you are, but I, no, I, I mean, think it's part of the condition of healthcare. No, I'm feeling great. I'm with the trees. I'm, with, <laughs> I'm, I'm walking on thin air. It's, you know, I get to dream up here. And Wait, everyone remember to drink some water. It's all good. Yeah, please, everyone, drink water. Um, I, I think is pick it up on what Larry is saying. I think that we have to come to the reality that in the 21st century, a sick care model is not the right answer. That we have to rethink the narrative and it's about health and well-being. And to use my term inside of Kaiser Permanente, how do we maximize the healthy life years of individuals? I think that's the first part which suggests that we move away from a fix me system to a whole health system that is not bound by the lane that we're in now called healthcare. It looks at bringing all aspects of health as an ecosystem. So it's not bound by the four walls or the yeah. many yeah. parts of a health system campus. Yeah, uh, for our 12 and a half million members, for the ones who are living in communities in which they can't get fresh foods, uh, we can benefit their health more with figuring out how to solve to that problem and then helping them understand how to cook, how to exercise, uh, building a more safe environment for them to play and to live and to, in essence, reduce the stress level and to exist in a very competitive environment. We all live now in the 21st century a whole different set of circumstances that we all face. From trying to figure out how to get through the day to being wired 24 seven, 
uh, to trying to figure out how to deal with multiple demands. Uh, we live an exciting life. It does something to the body and the body needs to be in great shape to take it on. And so how do we design a health system that focuses on prevention as the best medicine, which speaks to self-care, and then early detection, early diagnosis, early treatment? How do we deal with a system of coordination of care and services that deals with what you just described, chronic care, and doing it in a way that is not episodic, right? And, and so we, we have models. Our physicians at Kaiser Permanente think that if one of our members comes in from a diabetic attack, that's a failure of our system to figure because we haven't figured it all out to keep that member as healthy as possible with diabetes outliving their life. And so that's, I think, the both exciting and daunting challenge that we have in front of us. One of the things that I think makes our system different, you know, I, I often say to people, no one in their right mind would ever design a system like the US health system in the way it has evolved, because it just is not efficient and, and in a sense, it works in opposition to doing what you're trying to do at Kaiser and what you're trying to do with the merger with Aetna and what you're hoping to do in terms of this new model of, of a community-based, more affordable care. Our health-based system here is really based on opposition. Payers and providers, you know, PBMs and drug makers. Everyone's sort of fighting to sort of say, I'm the one that's bringing the value, you're the one that's causing the problem. How do we solve that? Do we solve that just by, in a sense, we get married <laughs> and we all just become part of one family and vertically integrate so we don't have to spar as much? Well, both of us, I, I admire what Bernard has done at Kaiser because I think he has created the framework for a solution in that you know, he is centering healthcare around you know, the patient. And I think the challenge that we have today is, as you look at healthcare, it's a series of transactions. And you know, who's connecting the dots across those, those transactions versus the opportunity that we have to provide care management you know, to you know, patients, consumers, individuals? Those words are all starting to get blurred now. And, yeah, and, and I think that's, that's the direction that we need to go. We need to take healthcare to where you know, the people are, okay, to the communities in, in which they live and work. And it's the opposite today. So in our system, we all think that it happens through competition. If you succeed in, in setting up what is sort of essentially a, a different kind of model of almost primary care, in the retail setting, in most every neighborhood where there's a CVS, and there are a lot of neighborhoods where there are CVSs that are coming to mind, thank you very much. Um, does that then threaten the hospital? Does that then threaten the physician's office? The AMA just sort of felt, came out in opposition to your merger, feeling that it threatens them in a bit. No, you know, Bert, let, me put, I, let me put two mics on that then. <laughs> <laughs> let, 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 let me go back to, you know, Bernard, you know, talked about, you know, that, that patient with diabetes, okay? And, you know, if, if, if we play that out here for a minute, because I'm, I'm sure everybody here knows someone, okay? For hypertension? You know, or? Well, you know, that, that, that patient is probably going to the physician, you know, three, four times a year. They leave the doc's office with a care plan, and if they're, you know, patient with diabetes, it's medication, it's diet, exercise, nutrition, and here's where the system breaks down because, you know, no one knows what's happening in terms of is that patient following that care plan, you know, in between visits, and the fact that we're in communities all across the country, we believe that we can fill that void, and we can be a complement to you know, the work of the physician, you know, the work of that patient's medical care team, you know, to keep them adherent, you know, to that care plan, because the studies are out there, and there, there are folks here, you know, in the audience that have written them that, you know, have quantified the fact that, 
you know, there are significant numbers of, you know, patients with chronic disease that are not following that care plan. It's costing our healthcare system billions of dollars every year in avoidable and unnecessary costs. But it, and at the same time, we're not helping those individuals achieve their best health. So I don't see this community-based model as a replacement for, you know, hospitals or, or physicians. I see it as a complement, you know, to the work that they do because of the voids that, you know, we see going on all around us in healthcare today. Yeah, I would second that. I, I think that one of the things that um, we have to be careful about, <clears throat> you know, first of all, in, in my narrative of recrafting how we think about health and health care, uh, in no way, in no way do I want to diminish the great work that's been going on in the healthcare industry. Uh, uh, you know, as I'm talking to you right now, I, I promise you with my own statistics, uh, my doctors and nurses, most wonderful people, they're operating on a patient right now and they got the chest open and they're going to do this great heart surgery and that patient is going to be up in the next couple of hours walking around and in our system because of all the wraparound services, they'll probably be going home in the next couple of days starting a brand new life, all right? So to that patient, they're going, this is a great healthcare system. To the innocent one who may pass out in the streets that now in the healthcare industry, we could diagnose you immediately and figure out what to do about you. We're living in a day and age where we have figured out how to cure a certain illness. So great progress, but that's a very expensive system and it's focused on sick care and fix me. And what we're describing here is a whole new ecosystem of health where it comes together as a whole system as opposed to is siloed now in each part of the industry. And we have a real opportunity to innovate and redesign the whole healthcare landscape. And yet, that's an expensive proposition too. So if you're not relying just on the, you know, the gazillion dollar MRI machine or, or you know, latest technology to solve problems, it really comes down to people. You, know, you take that data and now you have to make it actionable. And we are in a, an era in this country where the hunt for talent is really very competitive. So as you build out your community-based retail health system, as you build out and do more uh, uh, social determinants of health programs, you need people to go out there and, and interact. Where are you gonna find the talent? Well, Bertha, I, I don't think there's a company out there that doesn't have as, as one of their key priorities. How, how do you attract, inspire, and retain, you know, that top talent? And, you know, listen, I, I, we all have a number of programs, you, you know, that, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, training programs. Uh, I, I think one of the dynamics that, you know, that we're beginning to see, especially, you know, in this millennial generation is, you know, we, we think about what we were focused on when we were out looking for that, you know, first job or perhaps that second job. And, you know, in today, you know, I see many, many more people that want to understand the purpose of, of the company, the purpose of the organization, what's the mission. And they want to be inspired by that. And, and they want to make sure that their work, you know, you know has a contributing factor to whatever that happens to be. And, and I think, you know, for reasons that, that we're talking about, we can deliver, you know, on that, on that part of the inspiration. And I think, you know, in, in our particular case, we, we have a, a set of diverse assets where, you know, we can create unique development programs, you know, to help people grow, you know, uh, you know in their roles and, and achieve their, you know, their professional aspirations. But at the same time, I do think that innovation, you know, around, you know, attracting uh, talent is going to, you know, need to be different. We've, you know, piloted a program. We started a few years ago where, you know, we actually have created an apprenticeship program for pharmacy technicians. Uh, it's now across 12 states. We have about 5,000 of our colleagues enrolled in that program. It's, it's been absolutely a home run. And I think we need to think, you know, more like that in terms of all the other opportunities that, you know, can apply in a similar fashion. You know, we, we would have never thought about that, you know, four or five years ago. 
Yeah, I, I agree. We, um, we have, you know, training programs and things that we invest in uh, around our people. We're opening up a, a medical school in 2020 in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And we're on a mission now to really, um, through our permanent medical groups, teach future physicians about team-based care, stress management, all the things that we practice inside of Kaiser Permanente. So we want to make a bigger contribution to medical education. We also have um, a challenge, and it's an opportunity. Um, we have 220,000 employees, and some of our issues are around as we introduce more technology into healthcare, how do we bring the workforce, workforce along? Mm -hmm. And how do we make sure, uh, at least in Kaiser Permanente, everyone is clear that our technology strategy is not a replacement strategy of the human touch, it's an extension of that. It helps to enable that. Um, but how do we continue to build the skill sets in our organization and to make sure that people obviously feel empowered uh, towards the destiny that we're creating together as opposed to a victim of something that's being dictated to them. Where do you feel we are in the game? We, we were talking earlier how some of this disruption and innovation isn't, it about, isn't about that big bang, isn't about the big home run but hitting those singles and ground balls, just to keep the metaphor in baseball, what inning do you feel you're in? Oh. Uh, <laughs> the third inning, the first quarter, the <laughs> third well, team. I'll tell you what, you're, you're, you're ahead of where we are, so that makes us the bottom of the first, I guess. So. <laughs> I, th I think, I think. Um, so, so, Tell me what it looks like when you get at least, say, to the seventh inning stretch. Um, that the uh, whole health system is now community-based and technology connects everything. And so the whole health system being Kaiser Permanente or Kaiser Permanente being able to talk with CVS, CVS's health system, or talk with Geisinger or talk with Mount Sinai. You know, the, the, the walk from paper-based to, you know, electronic health records and et cetera is a challenge. But I, I would also tell you though, once that platform is built, there are so many things you can do differently now. We use the metaphor inside of Kaiser Permanente because it's our reality now, is that care can be anywhere. So the idea that um, we have historically in the industry designed a health system, quite frankly, with the hospital being the centerpiece and everybody had to come in and then you had medical office buildings, et cetera. But what we did was we trained our patients generally that you had to come to us for everything. Well, now with technology and everything, we're demonstrating that no, you don't have to come in for everything. I'm connected. I can email what you need. I can and you do, do more than half messaging. of your interactions digitally. Yeah. Because frankly, a lot of us are too busy to have to even call. We're, I, I've become like the kids. I text me. Yeah. I'm, and I'm and it's a way to empower, happy. empower the person, the consumer. It's a different kind of relationship, but it's based on a relationship with your provider. Now, as I say that, it, there's a lot of uh, reengineering that has to go on behind the scenes because a day in the life of a physician, for example, is very different today than it was 25 or 30 years ago. And so how do we um, reorganize and rethink, for example, so what does productivity mean now? How do we think about access now? And um, combat burnout as And how do we deal with burnout? And more exactly. responsibilities. I mean, my mom's you know, geriatrician, God bless her, she is not in direct primary care, she is not in a concierge practice, but she spends time with her patients and she will text you and call you back. Yeah. Not everybody has time or really finds a way to do that. Bertha, I, you know, I, I see this dynamic. You're hearing people you know, begin to talk about you know, consumerism in, in healthcare and you know, a couple of years ago, we started talking about the retailization of healthcare. Why, why did we use that term? Each and every one of us, you know, here, you know, makes, we're consumers of something. And whatever that happens to be at the moment, you're, 
making a, your own value proposition about where you choose to go. It may be based on convenience, price, service. You know, you're defining your value proposition. At that particular point in time, At that, may change. If you're right, okay. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is do we have that in healthcare today? Because you see benefit designs, plan designs, you know, pushing more uh, decision making and accountability to that, let's call them consumer of healthcare, but yet the tools to support that thought process, are they there? And, and I think you know, all too often they're not. Sometimes they are and there's so many of them you don't know how to navigate them. And, they, and again, they're all there. Your em large employer has put them all together, but they don't necessarily coordinate with one another. They, they have their little lane that they're very good at, but don't always coordinate. But in part, that's why I'm saying we're in the third, now fourth inning. Um, <laughs> it, it, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm now in the top of the second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Be, because we start with um, an integrated model and we start with the end-to-end -end responsibility, right? And, and so if you look at the industry that is still basically on a fee-for-service chassis, I would argue that incents the wrong behavior sometimes. Not bad people, it's just the incentives are aligned where I have to produce a certain amount of volume to get a certain amount of payment. And our model says, I'm gonna pay you to take full responsibility working with individuals and population to produce these outcomes and these results. I think that um, there are a lot of challenges now in how we continue to transform that to become even more relevant to someone living in the 21st century. And so for me, it is a combination of how do we continue to perfect medical excellence but also, how do we look at all the wraparound services that we should be engaged in, involved in, on behalf of our member and the communities in which we exist? So a medical record of the future, or medical information of the future, will not just have my blood pressure and all those wonderful things. It would talk about uh, what my social network looks like. It will talk about what my eating possibilities are or, or challenges are. It will talk about my stress levels at a different level. And quite frankly, I will have much more wrapped around me with sensors that gives me a chance to better understand my body and what I can do to take more responsibility for my health. And by the way, make it all cool. <laughs> Making it all cool. And speaking of cool, I want to open it up in the last few minutes we have to the audience. Uh, I'm sure folks have uh, some <coughs> great questions they want to ask. Um, gentleman here in the shirt, I think we have a microphone for you. Steven Summer from uh, Denver, Colorado. Larry, I'd like to ask you whether you have any plans now that you've bought an insurance company to move away from the fee-for-service model and move more to what uh, Kaiser has since you were, you identified some of the problems with fee-for-service medicine you're combining um, drug company with CVS with an insurance company, does that give you the opportunity to go in a different direction? I think that this combination absolutely gives us the opportunities for new plan designs uh, you know, that you know, incentivize the right behavior in, in terms of some of the things that Bernard was just alluding to. And you know, that's something that you know, we're anxious to get started to, uh, to work on. Um, how about back in the corner Sorry to make you run. Hi, my name is Amy Lin from Washington, D.C. I work in global health, and it's a really interesting discussion. I wanted to pick up on that last comment of let's make it cool. I think a lot of what we struggle with in global health is how do we encourage our target communities to pick up on the interventions or the practices that we think are important. How do you think about using marketing practices or retail strategies or others to cut through the noise of the everyday and empower the consumers with the information they need and only that information and make it attractive for them to act on it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's um, a big part of our challenge in the, in the healthcare industry as we are continuing to transform and to um, figure out how to reach populations and individuals in very different ways. 
We're doing, for example, a, a um, we're committed to destigmatizing mental illnesses in this country. And we have uh, arrangement with unbelievable people who have been willing to work with us from sports stars, uh, Steph Curry, who's been doing some uh, media work with us. Uh, we kicked off our campaign with Kendrick Lamar, who brought um, a wonderful song about I Love Myself. And we have figured out how to put that into our uh, first campaign to target children to say, if you are having something that's going on, find your words. I think we have to look at modern tools and techniques that gets the attention of very busy people who are listening to a lot of noise every single day. And we have to step out of our um, internal uh, stats that we love to talk about. Uh, no one understands HEDIS except for us, right? <laughs> and so we got to figure out how to make all of that relevant and cool to the 21st century. And I think it's very exciting, by the way. We've got time for one more, the woman in the uh, coral. So thank you, my name is Stella, I'm from Kenya. I mean, it's interesting to listen to this discussion about how you're moving away from out-of-pocket payment um, model of, 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 of financing healthcare systems. Yet, in where I come from, like in Kenya, for example, is that we are trying to kill the community health model system and moving towards um, more of, um, in terms of financing, we're either having insurance-based, we're either also um, having the, the out-of-pocket, and this is just actually being driven by the market forces and being driven by privatization of healthcare. How then do we, as we sit here discussing about global solution, and, and, it, and it actually touches across the globe, and how do we carry some of these lessons and, and ensure that even as you're coming in, as investors are coming in within developing countries, that the same models are actually being adopted instead of pushing towards uh, market-driven forces of, of healthcare systems. Oh, that's a great that is a panel in itself. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I um, I'll start. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about my answer yeah. to that. Actually. You know, I, I think that um, we would not really see, and and I would put Kaiser Permanente in there as well, the total transformation of healthcare until we've also redesigned the economics of healthcare. And the idea that um, we can stand up and say truthfully that we have the most efficient, effective healthcare system on earth, and we think the next set of solutions is how to add to that, I think we would be kidding ourselves, uh, both as a health system and as a country. I think that part of our work uh, ultimately is in the empowerment of the people who are actually paying us for the things that we do, but done in a way that the incentives are aligned for the right behaviors and outcomes that we need to do. The fact that we haven't even figured out how to really tell you how much we're charging as an industry for what you are actually paying for is a great example of how far behind we are as an industry. Right, and there's no such thing as, yeah. And there's no such thing as we cannot do it. In fact, we're gonna prove it one day at Kaiser Permanente that really puts it in the same term as a true consumer going in for anything else. That's unstacking a lot of things in the industry to better understand that. I think the second thing is, um, there's a big difference between um, access to coverage and affordability of access to coverage and access to care, and the affordability to access of care, yeah. right? And we deal in this country where people are trying hard, paying money to afford access to coverage, but then when they need to interact with the care system, they discover there's a big gap in the affordability of how do I now get the care. Until we solve those two things, we are a long ways from transforming healthcare uh, in this great country. And, and you know, Bernard, uh, you said that very well, by the way, but 
Yeah, bring it home. Bring why, it home. Why, well, no, I'm, 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 I'm going to. I'm going to give you an example, okay? Because you know, it, you know, in our shop, we just had a discussion about what is transparency, mm -hmm. and how do we make transparency actionable? And, and I'll give you an example of, you know, something that we're in the process of rolling out because there's been so much rhetoric and discussion about drug pricing. But yet, think about that physician when he or she is writing that prescription. You know, that doc has no idea the out-of-pocket cost of that medication right. for their patient. So we're in the process of embedding, you know, that patient's plan design, you know, in the patient's EHR. So when the physician goes and you know puts that prescription in, assuming they're prescribing it electronically, and today about 80% of all scripts. You know, are prescribed electronically, he or she will be able to see the patient's out of, out of pocket costs and up to five alternatives and the cost associated with each. One of the things that we're seeing is physicians are switching to a lower cost alternative 30% of the time with an average savings to the patient of $70. Yeah. And I think, Bernard, that's a great example of what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. We could go on here for hours. We didn't even get to my pet peeve, and I won't give you my rant on billing. It's not just, you can't tell me how much it costs. Why does it take Ooh. seven different times to bill afterwards? But. <laughs> Next year. I, I will spare you. I will spare you. That is my personal rant, and one of the things I think really bogs everything down. Thank you so much for your thoughts and I, I think you've given Thank us you. a lot. Thank you. You've given us a lot to think about over the next few days. And thank you. Thank you so much. Bernard, Larry, Bertha, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. So now it's time to officially open Spotlight Health. And to do that we have our own special opening ceremony. We traditionally ask 10 inspiring participants to light the torch for us with 10 brave, overlooked ideas to ignite your imaginations. So let's hear from them now, ladies and gentlemen, 10 brave new ideas. Vida. Yes, 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 yes. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Davida Davison and I am from Food Lab Detroit, and I have a big idea. We all know too well the visible forms of racism in our society. We know the inequities in opportunities and income. We even know how police violence plays out in communities of color. That's why we know the names of Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland. But what we don't know is that we don't know the names of millions of African Americans who are killed every year due to an invisible form of racism. Do you all know that the deadliest weapon that is used against the poor and people of color, the deadliest weapons that keeps them poor, that keeps them sick, that keeps them obese, that keeps them addicted to a sugary, salty, and starchy diet, the deadliest weapon is our food system. So my big idea is to build a brand new food system. But, but here's the deal. In order to build a new food system, one that feeds us all, and one that does not perpetuate systemic racism against millions of people, we have to start by listening to the voices of those who are most deeply impacted by our toxic food system. So here's my big idea. In a huge collaborative partnership, armed with the survival strategies of our ancestors, things like collectivism and a commitment to social change. I see farmers, I see chefs, I see restaurateurs, I see food entrepreneurs, food justice activists, food sovereignty organizers, all coming together to design and launch my big idea, which is the Dream Cafe. I envision this Dream Cafe as being our laboratory 
of how we practice food production and food service in a way that is truly cooperative, collaborative, and yes, equitable. My big idea is that this dream cafe over the next 12 months pops up in cities like my hometown, Detroit, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Atlanta, and yes, Puerto Rico. And the dream cafe is a place not only that serves delicious and healthy locally sourced breakfasts, lunch, and dinners, but the Dream Cafe is a space where we come together to learn, where we come together to exchange knowledge, where we come together and teach. We teach the community and we teach food workers who want to learn how to use the power of food, food that can help heal us, that can help empower us, and that can help transform our communities. That's my big idea, guys. Thank you very much. How would you like to follow that? <laughs> I, I can't touch the spirit of that, but that was magnificent. I will take you from that global vision of nurture to the nature of genomics. I'm Robert Green. I'm a medical doctor who specializes in genetics. I see patients. And I'm also a researcher in genetics at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Broad Institute and Harvard Medical School. And I want to talk to you today about a provocative idea, which is this. Let's throw out the construct of dominant, recessive, and X-linked heritability. Now, at first, you can say, wait a minute, that's the backbone of genetics. Well, we inherited that from peas and fruit flies. <laughs> and when we looked at human disease through the lens of that construct, we did find conditions that fulfilled that construct, and we called them our first genetic conditions. But the more we learn, the more we realize those constructs are completely inadequate. Those constructs do not help us when we're trying to explain genetic conditions to patients, to society, and to ourselves. In my research lab, we are doing something a little counterintuitive. Instead of sequencing genetic conditions, we're sequencing healthy or apparently healthy people like most of you. We're sequencing healthy adults and we're sequencing very provocatively healthy newborns. And what we're finding is really exciting, a tremendous amount of genetic diversity and genetic breakage that's there but not expressed, or at least not expressed until later. So here's my proposition. What if instead of that construct we had something, I'm sure there's some company working on this, but what if we had instead a kind of molecular dashboard, which we started the day you were born with sequencing and other molecular information inputs, and then we updated it with the downstream molecular uh, outcomes with gene expression, with protein amalgamation, with organ function. And what if this became part, just one part, of that matrix of prevention that we're all hoping to glean? I will say that um, we're starting a clinic in preventive genomics in Boston. And uh, while your health insurance won't pay for it, maybe, maybe Larry will. Um, <laughs> all you Kaiser folks. If you want to explore, be one of the first explorers in getting your own genome sequenced and trying this idea, please give me a shout. Thank you very much. I'm very short. My name is Shada Salama. I am a faculty member at King Saud University, visiting scholar at the Media Lab at MIT, and also uh, Vice President of, for the M-Health Solutions at Anmar IT. What is the biggest problem and the most import important problem in healthcare today? That was the question I asked my grandmother. She answered, I want my doctors to care about me as much as they care about the disease they're trying to treat. But how can they do that without knowing all about her. Three years ago, she passed away. After she had a stroke, and the ambulance crew did not even know which hospital to take her to. 
This is why 84% of Saudis, they avoid ambulances, whereas globally, it is only 5% avoidance. My idea is to use OPAL, which stands for Open Algorithms, in a smart blockchain system that can help us to know more without having to share data, but rather sharing only safe answers. OPAL would have allowed the hospitals to share more broadly, so the ambulance crew could find the nearest, most equipped hospital to my grandmother's home in order to treat her in time. Not only that, Opal could also, um, Opal could also call the ambulance after detecting the symptoms of a stroke. Opal might even monitor her medication to predict a recurrence prior to the stroke even happening. Opal would have allowed her doctors, her other doctors, to know more about her conditions, to care more. My idea is Opal, the combination of open algorithms and blockchain for a true patient-centered care. And I am sure my grandmother would have loved it. Thank you. My name's Kiran Suckling. I'm the executive director of the Center for Biological Diversity. <laughs> but tonight, if I don't fall off the stage, I'm Frostpaw, the Center's climate mascot. And the reason I'm Frostpaw tonight is, well, I guess it's because somebody in the room has to be animal tonight. You know, humans evolved about 220,000 years ago. And in all the millennia since then, when they've come together to talk about important things, to make decisions, somebody there would have been dressed as a bear. <laughs> or had a salmon headdress. Maybe they would have brought eagle feathers. Maybe there would have been sage burned. And that's because back then, just as it's true today, plants and animals were critical parts of the community. And if you're going to think about what's good for the community, you had to have everyone in the community there in some way. And that's what they did. And if you didn't, then you weren't really having a community discussion. The decisions that you made could not really be trusted to be for the good of the community. And I think could not be trusted to really be self-aware. Now, in the West, we've kind of fallen away from that. Not entirely. I'm here. And I don't mean as a joke, I got invited here which is an indication that it's not totally gone. Um, and the consequences that have been that our sense of community is much smaller. Our meetings are much smaller. What we talk about is smaller. What we think about is smaller. And I think it makes us less aware of who we are. Now, we've come to relearn fairly recently that the human body is itself a multi-species community. Some 90% of all the cells in your body belong to other species. And without them, you would die. But probably more Importantly, from a healthcare perspective, if we disrupt that community, your physical health and even your mental health will suffer. And so medicine now has come to really think about the microbiome and the importance of that. Now, we're a little less further along in understanding the ecological community, or what I like to call 
the community of Earthlings. And that's the community that includes aspen trees and butterflies, trout, raven, and in some places, polar bears. And so my thought is, we will never, ever have true community health until we start to relive and relearn a larger sense of community. And until we re-love a larger community that perhaps meets outside in a tent instead of a building, we are not going to have a healthcare system that works for society, that works for individuals, or that works for all the plants and animals that we are in community with, whether we know that or not. Thank you. How does one follow a bear? <laughs> uh, my name is Agnes Igoe. I come from Uganda. I ran after human traffickers, and I founded the Dream Revival Center to Rehabilitate Survivors. So this is my idea. Who, who is the best fit to help us put the, an end to human trafficking? Is it the doctors? Is it the lawyers? Is it the politicians? Who is the best fit? Yes, all the above are good collaborators, but who am I missing? Survivors. What if we empowered survivors to disrupt human trafficking networks? 40 million people are enslaved today, and we are not putting the best people to use to help us crack down on human traffickers. How do I know this? I flee from the Lord's Resistance Army, and they targeted me for sexual exploitation. I was displaced. But I worked my way through and went beyond just being given basic needs to learn skills. Because you know what? Survivors have skills. They can make the best investigators. They can make the best intelligence officials because they've lived it and they know better. So let's move beyond the basic needs approach in supporting survivors and give them the real skills needed to disrupt networks. I did that, and oh boy, I give them help, helpless nights. <laughs> Yes, again, let's move beyond the best needs and support survivors to get the needed skills to crack down on human traffickers. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Keller, I, I'm the founder of Zipline and my work brings me to a lot of health centers all over the world, which is how the majority of humans on the planet experience healthcare. And if you've visited any one of the millions of health centers on the planet, you know that they're typically uh, staffed by maybe a nurse or a nurse practitioner. Stockouts are a huge problem, sometimes they range at between 20 and 30 percent of products are stocked out at any given time. Expirations are very common, uh, and generally there, there, uh, there aren't enough health facilities or nurses to support the patients that depend on, on these centers. Now, a couple months ago, I got to go to the Mayo Clinic for the first time, and I was totally blown away. I mean, I, I, when I was there, I, I, it seemed like the best hospital in the world. You have access to the best doctors, the best diagnostics, the best treatments, all of the newest things that medicine has to offer. 
My big idea is that in the next 10 years, disruptive technology is going to make it possible to make every clinic on the planet into the Mayo Clinic. I think that when you look at disruptive technology like telepresence, you know, I read the other day that more than half of all patient visits at Kaiser Permanente happened over a smartphone. Well, guess what? Smartphones are becoming ubiquitous in the developing world, especially in Africa. 4G networks are rolling out across countries. Rwanda is going to have national 4G coverage by the end of 2019. Autonomous aircraft. Uh, are going to make it possible to totally change the way supply chains work. Zipline delivers 25% of the national blood supply of Rwanda using autonomous aircraft today. And once it becomes possible to start to transform the way supply chains work, that's going to make it possible to bring new kinds of medicine into these markets. Medicine like CRISPR therapies or immunotherapies, uh, cancer therapies that are uh, that have short shelf lives and are cold chain dependent and can be very, very difficult to handle from a supply chain perspective, we can now bring those directly to every human on the planet. So I think it's very easy to look back 50 years from today and think about the things that we did 50 years ago that were barbaric. But if we look 50 years from today and ask what about today will people 50 years from now think is barbaric, it's that people's access to healthcare depends on the GPS, GPS coordinates of where you live. Every human on the planet deserves access to healthcare, and we can turn every clinic into the Mayo Clinic. Thanks. Hi there, my name is Toya Najai. Um, I'm a primary care doctor and, and the co founder and chief health officer of City Block Health. My big idea is this. In order for individuals and communities to live longer and healthier lives, the health system has, that cares for them has to adopt a whole new operating model, one in which trust is the leading performance indicator. My perspective comes from the front lines of delivering care to people for whom the difference between trust and not can be life and death. For people um, with chronic diseases, who live in poverty, with mental illness and substance use disorder, who struggle with the day-to-day -day, um, barriers that our society sets up for healthy living. These are folks for whom the difference between trust and lack of trust could mean leaving the hospital against medical advice instead of getting life-saving dialysis. Could mean having a baby at home under unsafe conditions instead of accessing a hospital. Could mean someone with mental illness struggling and suffering at home until their symptoms become unbearable without asking for help. In today's healthcare world, the prevailing paradigm measures success for health systems and for providers on the basis of visits completed, perfor procedures performed, beds filled, medications dispensed. What's resulted is more health care, but frequently poorer health, and particularly true for the most vulnerable amongst us, those people whose bodies bear the scars of trust broken, not only in their private lives and their personal lives, but in the very fabric of our society's institutionalized structures that diminish and disempower them and also in health systems that at their times of need failed to listen to what really matters, did things to them and not with them, and they're so quick to sacrifice trust at the altar of higher revenues and quicker throughput through their hospitals and clinics. This world is changing but not quickly enough, and it's giving way to a paradigm in which health, and not simply health care, is the ultimate goal. So as someone who's striving to build and to shape this promised land, I'm here to tell you that the currency in that new world is trust. In my world, health system executives are asking, do the patients we hope to serve trust us? Are the systems that we build worthy of that trust? Have we built individual and collective relationships based on mutual respect, on dignity, on understanding and honesty? Have we earned the right to guide and champion and accompany our patients through the different choices and, and journeys ahead of them? My big idea is that we will learn to measure and value and to build trust. That health systems and providers will compete, they will be judged, they will be rewarded on the basis of the trust they engender with their patients and their communities. Because without trust, there's no health. So welcome to this new world. Hi, my name is Jack Andreka. I'm a global health researcher at Stanford, and I combine big data, engineering, and anthropology to help support the local healthcare needs of these communities I work with. And my big idea is to question this kind of tendency that we have to associate science and democracy as natural bedfellows. Because when we think of science, 
we think of this very dem democratic exchange of ideas where the best rises to the top. But this really isn't the case. Some voices count far more than others, and some voices aren't heard at all. And the silencing exists and operates along these existing lines of inequality and works to hide these structural powers that decrease the health outcomes of patients around the world. And really, the silencing is an invisible silencing, where science continues to portray itself as this neutral, objective object when it's anything but. And it becomes dangerous because of the powerful truth-making ability of science in our society and global health discourse. And I see this danger every single day in my work in Sierra Leone and Tanzania, where my partners are silenced. Their narratives of unclean water and crushing poverty are silenced by walls of statistics and numbers of these international monetary organizations and transnational mine conglomerates. And this narrative of nothing to see is despite this obvious effect of unclean water of environmental contamination, of crushing poverty, and negative health outcomes that these organizations create in these countries. And this is despite what this is happening, this is silencing the narratives of my stakeholders who have found heavy metal uh, levels in their water exceeding 100 times the healthy amount. And this is because science coagulates around real world power. The power over scientific discourse coagulates around real world power, like money, position, reputation. And this needs to stop. This needs to change. We need to realize that science in its current form is neither democratic nor neutral. It's a highly political aristocracy where only some voices count. And it's now up to us to stage a revolution as a community such that everyone can have their voices count in global health. Thank you. I, I barely survived getting up those stairs, so hopefully. Um, I'm Jay Comernani, founder and chair of the Human Diagnosis Project, which exists to answer what we believe is the essential question of human health. When you or someone you love isn't well, what should be done? And in an interesting way, almost everyone in this room is answering that question in a different way. Whether you work for a government or an insurance company or a search engine or really any other organization that touches human health, we're all answering this question. And I think we're doing this because most, if not all of us who are in this room, want to live in a world where the people we love have access to all of the resources that they need to achieve their highest human potential. Open knowledge projects guarantee that that's not just for the people in this room and other people who are highly fortunate, but for everyone on this planet. Think about that next time you, there we go. Think about that next time you use the internet, which was primarily built on open source code, or Wikipedia, an open content repository. It's almost impossible to imagine life without them. But the most important form of open knowledge is just now beginning. We can, for the first time in human history, network the minds of billions of people together into a collective superintelligence to solve many of humankind's most challenging problems. And open intelligence would differentiate itself from something like open content because it would be much more like a two-way conversation as opposed to a book that you were reading. When you're sick, you don't wanna just read an article to figure out what to do, you actually wanna know what to do. When you're looking for a job, the same is true. When you're trying to figure out what's wrong with your computer, the same is true. The value of decision engines and the value of intelligence to solve many of our problems is truly transformative. Today, 10,000 healthcare professionals from 80 plus countries are already working together to build an open medical intelligence called the Human Diagnosis Project. And the use cases which are emerging are fascinating and unexpected. For one, we can now begin to use such a system to provide personalized medical education to any health worker anywhere. We can also use such a system to dramatically reduce physician burnout by actually automating many regulatory requirements such as CME, MOC, 
peer review, and, um, and many others, payment, billing, et cetera. And then thirdly, we can actually use such a system in a value-based healthcare world to actually enable payment based on the clinical nuance of an individual patient encounter, as opposed to merely using the code-based system that we use today. There are likely many more use cases for what I just described, which is what makes open ecosystems so powerful. They enable us to co-create the solutions to the most complex problems together. And more than anything, we must ensure that humankind's most promising invention, artificial intelligence, is available to all people and ultimately able to help every single person on this planet. And to do so, we need to nurture hundreds of open intelligence projects in all areas of human knowledge, and in doing so, elevate well-being for all. Thank you. Let's bring this home. Um, hi, all. I'm Katie Drasser. I'm Managing Director of the Aspen Global Innovators Group, and I would follow those leaders and those ideas anywhere. So let's give another round of applause for them. <laughs> Do you know what else is a good idea? Hiring wildly smart people who like to have fun towards something meaningful, and that is the Spotlight Health team. I want to give a huge shout out to the core team that since this day last year has been working to make this happen. Natalie, Sola, Tracy, Deb, they're probably not here because they're probably working. But huge shout out to them. This is hard work and we have fun doing it. Also, we have some amazing underwriters. We truly could not do this without them. Some of them have been with us since the very beginning. Some of them, this is their first year or somewhere in between. To each of them, we are grateful. And you know, far beyond financial support, our underwriters share their ideas and bring their br brilliant minds to campus. These are experts who sit at the bedsides of patients who work tirelessly in labs, who are entrepreneurs in their own right. Go find them, go meet them. They are really smart and I'm assuming you'll learn a lot from them. So huge thank you to our underwriters. So as we close this session, it's, al it's almost time. Um, I want to say a few words about wh why this gathering is so special and how you, as participants, get the most out of it. You are all here because you believe that people, all people, deserve healthy lives full of meaning and love. And I know that's a lofty goal, but that is the crew we are here. We are big dreamers and inexhaustible doers, and I can't wait for you all to meet each other. This tent is full of healers and government leaders and scientists and entrepreneurs, and I guarantee you that they're your future collaborators, they're your teachers, and, and eventually your friends. So go outside of your comfort zone. Don't be nervous about asking a question. Try to make some magic happen here. And I would encourage you, some of that happens in the biggest way outside of these rooms. It happens on the path out there definitely in line at the hot dog cart, and definitely at tonight's reception. So seriously, serendipity is the secret sauce of what makes this happen. Consider this your formal introduction to one another. Go make good trouble, and we can't wait to see where it leads. Thank you. Thank you.